we talk about meditation as training the mind. But we have to remember that the Pali word for mind, jitta, covers both what we think of as mind and also what we think of as heart. So we try to develop both a good mind and a good heart. Some people miss this. They think it's simply a matter of training the mind to understand the Buddhist concepts and then just to apply them. And the question of your goodness or lack of goodness doesn't come in. But that's really unbalanced and it really misses a lot of the training. A group of Abhidhamma students one time came to see a John Furang. Abhidhamma tends to be very analytical, interested in analyzing the concepts that the Buddha taught and then trying to apply those concepts to your experience. But with very little reference to the heart. So they came to see him. They'd heard he was a good teacher, but they didn't know what he taught. So when they arrived, he said, OK, close your eyes, focus on your breath. And they said, no, no, we can't do that. Why not? We're afraid that we'll get stuck on jhana and then be reborn as Brahmas. His response was, well, what's wrong with being reborn as a Brahma? Non-returners, the third level of awakening. They're reborn as Brahmas. And at any rate, being reborn as a Brahma is better than being reborn as a dog. The reference there, of course, was to people who are really good at the concepts, but don't have virtue, they don't have generosity. They could very easily be reborn as dogs. It's not the concepts that are going to help you understand. You have to understand what it's like to develop a good heart and a good mind together. And in the course of that, then the concepts will make a lot more sense. And you'll be able to do the practice, and the practice will have energy. Because there's a lot of need for nourishment as you follow the path. And our nourishment comes from a sense of our own worth. This is why you develop a good sense of who you are and what you're capable of, so that you feel worthy of a happiness that doesn't change. A happiness that's better than ordinary, because you're not harming anyone. It comes from looking at yourself as you practice acts of generosity, as you practice acts of virtue. You get a sense of your own goodness. That gives you confidence. As the Buddha said, people who are stingy, greedy, can't get into the right concentration to say nothing of the levels of awakening. That's for lack of virtue. There are people who are not virtuous who can get their minds strongly concentrated because they're good at compartmentalizing their minds. But that concentration is not going to be honest. You have to learn first how to be honest in your dealings with yourself, with other people, if you want to get a state of mind that is honest with itself. This is why when the Buddha taught his son, at the very beginning, he said, look at all your actions, your, wor your deeds, your actions done in the body, your words and your thoughts. Before you do them, ask yourself, what kind of intention do you have? What do you expect to come about as a result of that action? And if you expect any harm, don't do it. That's making you responsible right there. If you don't foresee any harm, go ahead and do it. But while you're doing the action, keep watch. And if you actually are causing harm, stop. Because there are a lot of things we don't understand before we do them. Only when we actually do them do we see what the results are. You can't just say, well, I had good intentions to begin with, and just plow right through. You want to test your good intentions to make sure they're skillful. So if you see any harm, stop. If you don't see any harm, go ahead. And then when you're done, you ask yourself, this action that I did, did it lead to harm you know, over the long term? And if it did, go talk it over with someone who's more advanced on the path, and then make up your mind that you're not going to repeat that mistake. 
this way, as you're trying to be harmless in your actions, you learn a lot of good qualities. You learn compassion for yourself and for others. You learn responsibility. You learn honesty. All of which are going to be good qualities to develop for the sake of the meditation. So this is why the Dharma is special. Not just anybody can master the Dharma. You have to be a good person to master the Dharma. And being a good person gives you the energy to keep on practicing. For example, with, with generosity. Someone once asked the Buddha where a gift should be given, and he was expecting the Buddha to say, give to the Buddhas. But the Buddha said something else. He said, give where you feel inspired. So start with your heart. Where does your heart want to be generous? Okay, be generous there. And then you can look at the results. You may decide after a while that you wanted something that was not really wise. But the important thing is you start with your heart. The same with the precepts. You realize that you don't want to suffer. Other people are just like you. They don't want to suffer. So you don't want to do anything that would cause them suffering. You look into your heart and try to see what's the best you can do with your heart. Now he said, meditate. The first meditation instructions the Buddha gives when he talks about acts of goodwill. You want to make your goodwill universal. Now, ordinarily, our goodwill is human. In other words, there are some people for whom we have goodwill and other people for whom we have ill will. We'd actually like to see them suffer. We feel that they've done wrong, they should be punished. But how many people actually learn from punishment? What you want is for people to see if they're acting in an unskillful way, to see that, and then to make up their minds on their own, that they need to change their ways. They want to change their ways, and they're willing to put in all the effort that's needed. When you wish that for someone else, that's, that's what genuine goodwill is all about. And you get a sense of your own power. You can generate goodness from within. You're not just a transmitter transmitting someone else's goodness through you. We learn of the goodness of the Buddha, we learn of the goodness of the Sangha, the people who have gone before us. But there has to be something within us that says, yes, that really is good and I want to do, do some goodness like that. And it requires a sense of yourself as an independent starter, yourself as an agent. So it's at this level of the practice that the concept of self is really useful. In fact, it's a necessary part of the path. When the Buddha was giving instructions to Rahula, the way he had Rahula express his questions to himself, this action that I want to do, this action that I am doing, this action that I have done, I, I, I. You make skillful use of that concept of self. And at the end you rejoice in the fact that you're doing well. And that's a healthy sense of self and a nourishing sense of self. It gives you energy to keep on practicing. Because you realize the path is not going to get done on its own. You have to do it. But you're capable of doing it and you're going to benefit. And you have proof of that in yourself. You can see yourself acting in good ways. This is why John Sowat, when he was teaching in Massachusetts, I think it was the third day of the retreat. He looked out across the room and he mentioned to me, notice how grim everybody is here. And he looked out across the room and they did look pretty grim. It was like they had a band across their forehead saying nirvana or, or die. And then he attributed it to the fact that they didn't have much background in generosity, much background in virtue. They had gone just straight to the meditation. When you're meditating, your mind is wandering off, wandering off, wandering off. You begin to get discouraged. You wonder if the Buddha really was teaching something worthwhile. You wonder if you're capable of doing it, if it was worthwhile. But if you have some experience in the practice of generosity, the practice of virtue, you gain confidence in the Buddha, and you also gain confidence in yourself that you can do good things. We've learned that what for a little child is a counterintuitive lesson, which is when you give things away, you actually gain in happiness. 
when you hold yourself back from doing things that would put you in a position of having an advantage somebody over somebody, but actually would be doing harm. When you learn how to gain a healthy sense of self from being generous and being virtuous, you've learned an important lesson, that a lot of things in life require that before you can be happy, you have to give. Happiness is not just getting, getting, getting. It lies in the act of being responsible. And that strong sense of your responsibility. You're not just a victim of forces outside yourself. You're actually an independently good agent. That's really nourishment on the path. That's food for you on the path. So this is a way in which depending on yourself, as the Buddha said, nata yato no nato, the self as its own mainstay. This is the level of the path where you need that strong sense of self, that healthy cells, healthy sense of self, a nourishing sense of self that provides you with the energy and the nourishment you need to continue on the path.